Hello everyone, Alan Steady here, a network architect with Firewalls.com, bringing to you a Sophos XG Firewall getting started video. In this video, we'll walk through the initial setup wizard on our Sophos XG Firewall. So you've all already received your device, and there's just a couple of physical connections that need to be made. And in our example here, I'm physically connected to our LAN port, and our ISP gateway is physically connected to our WAN port. These ports are conveniently labeled port 1 LAN and port 2 WAN. Once we have successfully connected the firewall, we can reach the web admin or the CLI using a terminal application such as PuTTY to begin the basic configuration. To access the Sophos XG web admin, we're going to open our browser and navigate to https colon slash slash 172.16.16.16 colon 4444. This is the default IP of the firewall and default port that the web admin facility is listening on. Once we've established our connection with the Sophos XG firewall, we're going to get this nice welcome message and we will click here to begin. We'll kick off our basic configuration by immediately changing our admin password. To help us set a nice strong password, you can see that they give us some recommended parameters. This is an excellent practice to follow when creating passwords. We want to make sure that they meet a certain length, such as 10 characters in this example. It's going to include one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter, a number, as well as a special character. You can see by default that we're set up to install the latest firmware automatically during our setup. So once we're actually done with the wizard, our firewall will go and pull down the latest firmware update and initiate the installation. This is always a great idea to do before you start getting into the nitty gritty of your configuration. We'll also need to accept our end user license agreement. And you can also see that these are all hyperlinked. So if you wanted to read the EULA or the privacy policy along with the end user license agreement, you can certainly do so. We'll go ahead and select continue. So here we're actually presented with the option to name the firewall by default. Here we can see that it's going to use the serial number of the appliance. But if we're going to give the firewall a name, it needs to either be publicly or privately resolvable using a fully qualified domain name or FQDN. In this example here, we're just going to leave it set with the default serial number and we'll set our correct time. Setting the correct time is incredibly important from a logging and reporting standpoint. And if this is off, it's going to give us misleading information in those two key areas. This particular firewall is going to be deployed in Indianapolis, Indiana, which actually is another good point. Should you have a larger distributed network or enterprise, you'll want to think about where the firewall will ultimately reside. For example, if I'm building out the configuration from Indianapolis, Indiana, but the firewall is going to be deployed in another region in a different time zone, We'll want to use that as our time zone. We'll hit continue. In our example here, you can see that I already have license applied to the firewall. However, this won't always be the case. And if this is your first time setting up the appliance, this will not be the case. You will always have a free 30-day evaluation license that you can roll with and go back and apply licensing directly on the firewall or in your MySophus account. Should you already have your license and your PDF license schedule handy, you can add those license keys here, followed by verify. And let me move down here just a little bit. You can also see that we have a few different options. We can skip to finish, which will actually end the setup wizard and allow us to proceed with implementing our own configuration, or we can proceed with our basic setup wizard. We'll continue with the wizard for the sake of our video here, but it's worth noting that you do have that option available. Hit continue. Now we're ready to set up the mode and our LAN interface as well as our associated DHCP server if we're wanting the firewall to provide that function. Here in our gateway selection, you can see that we have two choices, a layer three route mode as well as a layer two bridge mode. More commonly, we will be configuring these edge devices to function as the gateway. Therefore, we'll leave this set to route mode. If you do need this to operate in bridge mode, you will select that here to inherit the WAN settings and disable DHCP. We'll leave this set to our layer three gateway mode and configure our local network subnet parameters. Configuring our LAN interface is going to replace the current port 
172.16.16.16 configuration with in our example 10.10.250.1. We'll leave our subnet set to a slash 24 and we can also again enable or disable DHCP associated with this interface. If you have your own internal DHCP server we would leave this unchecked and if we want the firewall to service DHCP requests we can enable that here and then specify our DHCP lease range. And before I move on, I do also want to point out this port image here is actually interactive. And you can also see that it has default ports designated for LAN or WAN. Where port 2 is enabled for the WAN. And ports 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 are enabled for the LAN. It is important that we understand the outcome of this type of configuration because what it's actually going to do is create a bridge interface pair and it'll do that for all of the port members selected. So if you need to configure additional interfaces in other zones, such as a DMZ, you will not want to proceed with this type of configuration. However, this can be modified from within the web admin post setup wizard, but it is worth mentioning that tidbit. Additionally, the number of ports here will vary depending on the Sophos XG model, since this is just an XG135, which has eight physical ports. Those are reflected here in our image. To remove ports from our network interface bridge pair, simply click the port, which you can then see it'll default back to being not configured, which you can see we can do for as many interfaces as we want. So in this setup here, we'll be left with just a LAN and a WAN interface. To configure our internet connection, and as demonstrated in our previous step, in order for the license and registration to sync with MySophos, it does require WAN connectivity. In our example here, our WAN interface is connected via DHCP, which is the default state of port 2. So if your internet gateway is set up with DHCP, you don't have to do anything here. However, if it is static, we can adjust our interface type and we'll enter in that IP information here. We'll hit continue. Next up, we can enable some network protection, which will be associated with our default LAN to WAN policy. Just keep in mind that the functionality of these scanning engines will be dependent on the type of licensing purchased or bundled with our firewall. In our example here, we're going to enable all of the network protection options. However, you do need to keep in mind that additional configurations will be required, which will be covered in greater depth in separate videos. We'll move on and hit continue. Now we're ready to set up our notifications and backup settings. The Sophos Appliance does have a built-in email server that is capable of notifying or alerting the admin or help desk of potential threats and outages, as well as automating the sending of backups. Here we can configure the email address that the appliance will use when sending such alerts and backups along with the recipient's address. This is where our alerts and backups will be sent to, and this is the email that the alerts or backups will be sent from. Should you decide to utilize your own email server, you can configure an external mail server here. We can also define a password that's actually going to encrypt the backups being sent. Again, we would always want to use a nice strong password. And we'll hit continue where we can see that this concludes the basic setup wizard. We can actually copy the summary and paste this into a Word doc or notepad, or have the summary emailed to us. Once done, select Finish, where the firewall will now attempt to pull down and install any pending firmware updates and or pattern updates, followed by a reboot. To reestablish our connection, if we change the LAN subnet, from our default configuration of our 172.16.16.0 subnet, 
may require that you have to renew your IP address or manually set it via the network adapter depending on if we enabled the firewall to service DHCP requests. Since we changed our port 1 IP, we'll go ahead and try to establish a new connection here. We can see that the IP address has changed here to what we had set it at within the wizard. We'll go ahead and try to reload our page. Excellent. So now we should be able to log into the web admin. And we'll take a look at some of our default configuration. And before we can do that, we'll actually need to create the secure storage master key. This is new to SFOS 18.0.3 and provides us with an extra layer of protection over our backups and imported configurations. And you can see down here that if you were to lose your secure storage master key, it actually says that you cannot recover it. That's not the case at all. And I'm going to include a link down below to a separate video that's going to provide an overview on how you can actually reset that master key. It's important to keep in mind that this master key is in addition to the backup encryption password that we actually set earlier on in this video. So we'll go ahead and create our key. And we also need to validate that we've stored our master key in a safe place. Create the key. Which is now going to give us access to our web admin with our default configuration. First thing we'll go ahead and check out is our interfaces, where you can see we have both our LAN and WAN interfaces that we configured as part of our setup wizard. And all of those other interfaces are unbound and can be configured. You may also notice that we have this guest AP wireless interface, which is actually associated with a couple of wireless networks that they add by default. If you're not using the Sophos firewall as your wireless controller, you can actually just go ahead and delete these. And we'll navigate back over here to our interfaces where you'll be able to see that that guest Wi-Fi interface is now removed. Next, we'll check out our rules and policies where we can see that we have a few default policies. They actually go ahead and give us a few different types of examples. You can actually see that these are disabled by default. And I would actually recommend removing them and creating your own purpose-driven firewall rules. We will cover all of these different types of examples in separate videos. So now you can see we're left with two different policies. One, our SMTP relay, is, as well as of our default LAN to WAM rule. Within our default LAN to WAM policy, we should go ahead and enable our logging. And scrolling down here, you can also see that we have a linked NAT rule, which is going to translate our LAN IP subnet to our WAN IP when we go out to the internet, as well as the various network protection options that we enabled as part of our setup wizard. And I won't dive too in depth into individual components as these appliances are very complex and as such we can be very granular with how we're defining our rule sets and scanning engines, applying policies for various types of traffic, and defining who and what we want to apply those policies to. So stay tuned and be sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel so you're notified of our future video releases. And if you found this video helpful, give us a thumbs up. And be sure to come and check us out at www.firewalls.com. Thanks for watching.